Segment 41, Post-Main Sequence Evolution of Massive Stars and Supernovae. The main sequence lifetime of stars varies rather radically on the main sequence. Massive stars lead short lives because they burn through their fuel so quickly. You'll recall that, that the, uh, the luminosity is increasing very rapidly as you go up the main sequence, much more rapidly than, than the mass. So the amount of fuel compared to the burn rate of that fuel goes down as you go to higher and higher mass, leading to shorter and shorter lifetimes for hydrogen burning. Until when you get to stars that are about 30 solar masses, their main sequence lifetimes are only about 5 million years. Um, we, as we discussed with the low mass stars, mathematical models of stellar interiors and the burning that goes on in them, the nuclear fusion that goes on in them, uh, is produces these theoretical plots of how stars evolve once they leave the main sequence. And then this is validated by looking at cluster HR diagrams so that we can uh, compare them to plots like this to see whether the stars in the cluster actually populate the space along these lines in quite the way uh, we see here. Now unlike the lower mass stars, high mass stars can initiate fusion of successively heavier elements. When you get to carbon in a low mass star, you're done. You simply can't uh, raise the temperature enough to start burning the carbon to make heavier elements. But as you go to high mass stars, you get this kind of onion skin uh, set of layers where on the outside you have a hydrogen burning shell with a helium fusion shell inside and a carbon fusion shell inside that and the carbon is making neon, the neon is making oxygen and the oxygen is making silicon and the silicon is making iron at the very core and each of these shells will be fusing uh, successively consuming a bit of what's inside of them as you go out and then the larger quiescent envelope of the star surrounds that. Now when you make hydrogen and you fuse it into helium, you release a very large amount of energy. The, the binding energy of helium is, is uh, very much more negative than in hydrogen, so you release a significant amount of energy when you fuse hydrogen to make helium. When you take helium and you make it, it into carbon, you release somewhat less energy, and when you make carbon into nitrogen, you release even less. And this is because you're having to contend with the electrostatic repulsion of the protons. You have more and more protons in each nucleus, and they're repelling each other. And even though the strong force is holding the nucleus together, uh, you have to work against this. And so it gets harder and harder to make a nucleus that, that actually has released more energy as you go along. And as you work your way up the periodic table doing this, you finally get to iron, which represents kind of an, an energy minimum in the system. And while you can make stable elements above iron, you actually have to add energy to create their nuclei. So you don't release any more energy once you get up to iron. So iron, in some sense, can be called the ultimate ash, because when you fuse elements that are lighter than iron, you release energy. And when you split elements that are heavier than iron, uh, have a higher atomic mass than iron, you you release energy as well. So iron represents kind of a minimum point in the in the binding energy curve. So that's why this this core of iron in the middle of the massive star takes on an extraordinary significance because he n no longer can you produce additional energy by fusing iron to make something heavier. And so the iron just builds up and builds up and builds up and eventually its density is large enough that it becomes degenerate and so it's like the de a degenerate white dwarf, but you're adding more and more mass all the time. And as you remember with the white dwarfs, the radius of the white dwarf gets smaller and smaller as you add more mass, until finally you reach the, the Chandrasekhar limit, which is the limit at which the projected radius, due to this uh, stiffness and, and uh, the gravity, even when the star is degenerate, will all of a sudden collapse. It will shrink to zero. So what happens is, that the core of this star collapses very, very rapidly, and the particles inside it come apart and form neutrons, releasing huge numbers of neutrinos. And then this material eventually reaches a point where the, ne where the neutrons become degenerate, and it becomes very stiff again. And the infalling material from above reaches this very stiff inner core, rebounds backwards, and creates an enormous shock wave that that flies out at very, very high speeds through the rest of the star, generating nuclear reactions that release even more energy. And this enormous shockwave comes to the surface, and a supernova explosion ensues, 
releasing huge amounts of energy to the point where the, super, the individual supernova can be as luminous as an entire galaxy for a period of days or weeks. So here's a picture of supernova 1987A because it happened in a fairly nearby region in the Large Magellanic cl Cloud. Um, we have images of the star before it exploded, and that you see on the left. And then here on the right, you see post-supernova explosion. This star, although it's 150,000 light years away, was visible with the unaided eye in, in the southern hemisphere in the few weeks after the explosion. It was a spectacular. It's the nearest supernova to go off in, in modern times. As a result, uh, an extraordinary uh, result was achieved, and that is that a neutrino detector in Japan, the Kamiokande experiment, which is a, a huge tank of water with photo cells inside it. Here it's being shown under repair. People are floating around in a boat fixing the photo cells. Uh, detected the neutrinos, a few of the neutrinos from supernova 1987A. This experiment remember that neutrinos don't interact very much with matter, so this experiment had to be very sensitive and detect only a very few neutrino events. But they, when they went back and looked at their records, they saw that these, this burst of neutrinos came at just the time that the, the, the visible light became visible from supernova 1987A. Here you see an illustration of a galaxy with a supernova going off in the outer part. You see the nucleus of the galaxy in the middle and the supernova found here. These are found nowadays mostly by automated systems. They used to be found by amateurs who scan the systems scan the sky, look at galaxies e every night or every week or every month and compare the galaxy photographs to previous ones looking for bright point sources that were not there before and these then get followed up as supernova events. What you see here are light curves, that is, plots of, of brightness versus time for different kinds of supernovae. And different supernovae, because of the physics of them, have slightly different curves. But you, in all cases, you see a very rapid brightening to some maximum, <coughs> and then a more gradual decline over time, over a period of, of a few hundred days. We can explain some of this decline as a result of radioactive decay, one of the byproducts of the supernova event is the formation of unstable radioisotopes, like for example nickel-56, cobalt-56, and their half-lives, that is the, the period over which half of each of those decays, govern the decline rate of the brightness of the supernova, because nickel-56, for example, half of it is decaying in a period of six days, and as it decays it releases energy, and this energy then excites some of the, the uh, atoms in the gas and they shine and produce the light that we see and as the nickel uh, nickel gets used up then this extra energy goes away the cobalt 56 then kind of takes over it has a longer half-life and so you get a, a, a less steep decline rate during the time that that's dominating the energetics of the supernova you also have a remnant, that is, material that's flying out from the surface of the supernova. This is material from the outer layers of the star that the shock is now pushing out into space. This is the famous Crab Nebula that was produced in a supernova about a thousand years ago. And this material we can measure the Doppler shift of, and it's moving out at tens of thousands of kilometers a second away from the center of the original remnant. Here's an older supernova which, where, where instabilities in the gas have produced this kind of ropey structure after five or 10,000 years. And it's, spread in, it's swept up materially in interstellar medium, and it's spread out over a much larger space, uh, a few parsecs in diameter at this point. So what, supernovae are very important to us because they, these non-equilibrium burning events in the supernova produce all the elements that are heavier than iron, and they also release many of the shell products, that is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, things like that, into the interstellar gas that, that can then become parts of new stars. The original gas in the interstellar medium only had hydrogen and helium in it, and it was this enrichment process from the explosion of the massive stars that put out the elements that are in stars like our sun, and of course that can make planetary systems like our own. So these are relevant to us because they're what we're made of. Supernova explosions released much of the material that goes into our body. All the iron in your blood came from a supernova ex explosion. The other important thing is what's called the russell Vogt theorem, which, which I mentioned to you earlier, which says that the evolution of stars is dominated by their initial mass. That you can look at a star at 10 solar masses, any star, and predict what its future will be. A star that's the same mass as the sun, you can predict what its future will be. 
So this outcome for high mass stars that produce supernovae is something of a demonstration of that.